Council's Energy Diplomacy Initiative, David Korani. Değerli konuklarımız, bu oturumda sözü Atlantik Konseyi Enerji Diplomasisi İnisiyatifi Direktörü Sayın David Korani'ye devrediyoruz. Good afternoon everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is the first afternoon session uh, on the three C's completing Europe infrastructure interconnections in uh, Central and South Eastern Europe. Um, this is a subject that, that the Atlantic Council have been focusing on in the last three years now. In November 2014, we published a major report under the chairmanship of General Jones on what we called completing Europe, uh, the North-South Corridor. And the thinking behind the report was that it's it was 2014, so 10 years after the Big Bang accession to the European Union, Central and Eastern European countries, uh, and then 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, if you look at the infrastructure map of Europe in the energy sector, in the transportation sector, also in the telecom sector, uh, then you see that there is, there is a, a missing uh, link as far as the north-south interconnections uh, go. All the countries, especially before and after the EU accession, in Europe's east focused on integrating their economies infrastructurally with the rest of Europe and, and of course Western Europe uh, and neglected to a large extent the, the north-south interconnections and intra-regional uh, integration. And it's a competitive disadvantage, it's a missed economic opportunity and it's also a foreign policy national security issue in as much as it makes these countries from an energy security perspective exposed and vulnerable to, to outside suppliers. So what we undertook with this report uh, is to remedy that problem, to fast track the infrastructure integration in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and we, in a, a report that amounted to about 130 pages, an unusually long report for the Atlantic Council, we, uh, the, the detailed analysis on where we are with these interconnections in the energy space, in the transportation space, in the telecommunication space, and then of course in the fourth chapter, we outlined some innovative ways to, to finance all this uh, with public-private partnerships in most cases. So uh, it is with great pleasure to have a fantastic panel uh, to discuss the progress of the report uh, uh, and the progress of the projects involved in the report. Uh, we got very fortunate in as much as the report and its conclusions were picked up first by the President of Croatia and then eventually by all the leaders in the region. Uh, they rechristened it the Three Seas Initiative uh, and they undertook on a presidential level and on a governmental level to, to, to, to support this and fast track the infrastructure integration. So before I turn to the panel uh, and have a moderated conversation on, on, on the report and its aftermath and where we are with some of these projects, let me ask General Jones, who was again the chairman of the original report, to deliver a keynote address on the main conclusions of the report and the progress we have made so far. So General, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And David, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is really a special honor to be asked to offer some keynote remarks uh, considering this very, very important uh, initiative, a very strategic initiative with potentially tremendous consequences for the European landmass. Um, this initiative is a bold vision to develop the infrastructure, the prosperity, and indeed the connectivity of the region which connects the Baltic to the Adriatic and the Black Seas. The Three Seas Initiative was, was originally called the North-South Corridor, but it, it's been renamed uh, by the countries that are most interested uh, in this project, and it's a very appropriate renaming. As David said, it was launched here in Istanbul in 2014 in a, re in a report that the Atlantic Council uh, commissioned, which is you can access online, and I had the honor of co-chairing that report with my counterpart, Pavel Oleknowicz from Poland, formerly uh, of Grupo Lotus Energy. In that report, uh, we suggested that the governments of Central and Eastern Europe and the European Union uh, work together to develop uh, north-south infrastructure 
um, between the Baltics and the Adriatic, essentially, in, with regard to telecommunications, transportation, and energy. Since that date, in 2014, I'm happy to be able to say at this forum that much progress has been made, including important reverse flow energy connectors within Europe, but much more must be done if this project uh, is to live up to its ambition, which is to truly connect and complete Europe. So this July, the Polish and Croatian presidents will convene a head of state summit with their counterparts from 11 three seas countries in Wroclaw, Poland. This summit will take place alongside the Atlantic Council's annual Wroclaw Global Forum and we have invited the President of the United States to also attend that forum. The timing of the summit, summit is extremely important and the opportunity uh, is enormous. First, the summit will take place at a time when the United States is formulating its new engagement strategy for Europe. And the Three Cs initiative should be a very important transatlantic initiative and it has the opportunity to serve as a new U.S. project uh, involving uh, where in, in, the, in the European landmass. American diplomatic efforts will be crucial for bringing the project to bear. Uh, American energy technology and engineering prowess can underpin the project's development, and U.S. financing can also help turn the project into a reality. In other words, this is truly a transatlantic link um, project that has, as I said, enormous geo geopolitical, geostrategic, and geoeconomic ramifications. Secondly, the new security challenges requires a project of great ambition, like the Three Cs Initiative. This project can develop greater resiliency among the countries of the region and better enable them to resist efforts from outside powers to successfully use energy as a weapon and a source of division. Thirdly, this initiative is about prosperity and bringing Central and Eastern Europe into greater convergence with Western Europe. More than 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the disparities between Central and Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe remain too great in terms of prosperity, infrastructure, and development. The Three Cs initiative is uh, an opportunity to change that and to turn this region of nearly 110 million people into an economic powerhouse and create a true European common market. So this panel will explore some of the regional perspectives and major technical challenges facing the implementation of the Three Cs initiative. And I do believe that 2017 is when we really have to talk uh, about implementation. Where are we going to start this? Where are we going to do it? How is it going to be done? How is it going to be financed? We, if we have to go through another year of just talking about it, I think it will be an opportunity lost and, and we will lose the tremendous momentum that we've built. So with that said, let me offer just a few more thoughts of my own. First, I think it's absolutely critical for the private sector on both sides of the Atlantic to be intimately involved in this effort. Attracting private investment will require greater unity from the countries in the region, and it will require greater financial, political, and technical support from organizations like the European Union. The business community, including the business community in the United States, will want to hear about what measures are being taken by the EU and regional governments to reduce red tape and permitting delays which complicate cross-border infrastructure development. And finally, the involvement and the participation of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the European Investment Bank will be an important sign of confidence for the investor community. So I very much look forward to this panel discussion and to carrying some of the key messages from this discussion to my next meeting uh, in Warsaw on the 4th of June, where I will meet with the national security advisors to the presidents of the 12 Three Seas countries. So thank you all very much for being here. And David, 
I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, General, for this uh, overview. Let me now bring in John Roberts, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Global Energy Center of the Atlantic Council and a veteran energy analyst. Uh, he was the principal author of the energy chapter of the original Nor uh, North-South Corridor report back in uh, November 2014, and then uh, an author of a follow-up study that focused on the gas interconnections in August 2016. So John, if you could get us up to speed on what happened in this space in the last three years, where do you see progress and what are some of the outstanding major items, especially focusing on the gas sector? The first thing is that the gas sector... And if you could just get the microphone closer to your mouse, that would be fantastic. Thank you. The first thing is that the gas sector is the, still the weakest. Electricity connections do need to be addressed, but they're coming along and they are not subject to the same problems that gas is, namely that gas essentially comes into Europe from two major suppliers in the north, Russia and Norway, and a variety of suppliers in the south, uh, both in the form of pipeline gas from North Africa and LNG from a variety of sources. The problem with gas is that you've got two classic energy islands. The isolation of one of them, namely the Baltic countries, is coming to an end. But the isolation of the other, most of Southeast Europe, is still there. Start with the Baltics very simply. There's a new LNG terminal at Klaipeda in Lithuania. That's working fine. And it's already, in effect, started to pay for itself because as a result of developing the terminal, Gazprom immediately cut its gas prices to Lithuania by 23%. Also, you've got the new interconnector line between Poland and Lithuania. And what is left in terms of achieving a market there is trying to get a proper sense of balance between, for instance, using the LNG terminal at Klaipeda for all three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, using Latvia's storage capacity for gas, and using perhaps Estonia for bunkering, particularly uh, adding in an element of energy security as a result of its new connections with Finland. So the Baltics are a classic example of the infrastructure being there, but not yet the market integration. Now, in Central Europe, you've got some of the infrastructure there, but not quite all of the infrastructure, and you don't yet have the market integration. And that's going to be quite complicated to achieve. The European Union is pushing a program right now that says in order to achieve energy security, there will be a set of regions within Europe in which it is agreed that if one part of that region goes short, the rest helps out. And that's good. But to do that, you need the infrastructure. You don't need that much, but you probably need some new infrastructure. You need upgrading of others, and you need to think what kind of capacity you want. The missing infrastructure that is really being addressed is the idea of a, contact, of a connection between the new pipelines coming in in the south, the Southern Gas Corridor, and Central Europe. This is the project known as Brewer, which is Bulgaria, Romania, then the U is for Hungary, and A is for Austria. That is actually underway primarily because it really serves Romania as both a transit country, but above all as a new gas, well, a revived gas production country. 
So it's not like a very big deal. It's not a brand new 30 BCM pipeline. It's developing a relatively small scale 4.5 BCM pipeline. But the great thing is that makes it a doable project and it is being done. There's another doable project that is important in this context. The proposed LNG facility at Kirk in northern Croatia. But it's been talked about for so long, we still do not know whether the Croats will actually get together and finally sign off on it. Why is it important? Because it constitutes one of the two anchors for a proper connection between the Baltic and the Adriatic, the other anchor being the LNG per terminal in Poland that's already up and running. And what's more, having been built, is now being expanded because it's so successful. So you've got the three connections that you can do. But I'll come to the last point, capacity. These capacities under development reflect current commercial requirements. Therefore, they're financeable largely because they don't need too much of a grant from international funding, and local companies can make up the balance. But in the event of a crisis, where for some reason, war, pestilence, act of God, you name it, either Russian or Norwegian gas to be cut off, the infrastructure would not be sufficient to cope. So we still need to work on a system that can take what can be paid for or justified commercially and make it just that bit bigger to handle an emergency. And this is the oldest problem of all. Who pays for an insurance policy? The private sector is notoriously bad at doing this and we have long ago lost the ability to develop large-scale public infrastructure with public sector funds. So we still need to address that issue. And at that point, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, John. Fantastic summary. Uh, let me now turn to Ambassador Georgia Ciamba, who is the State Secretary uh, of the Romanian Foreign Ministry responsible for bilateral and strategic affairs within the Euro-Atlantic area. Uh, Romania obviously is a key country as far as the Three Seas concept is concerned. It represents the Black Sea angle. Uh, it's a country that is a major gas producer already and is uh, satisfying its gas consumption mostly from domestic resources and it has the prospects of getting more resources from offshore Black Sea. So if you could just talk about the Three Seas concept from a Romanian perspective with special regard to these resources. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me. I think it's good that we are balancing a little bit the discussion. In a way, we were talking a lot about the Mediterranean, about the East Mediterranean, about the things in Syria, how this affects energy corridors. Now it's going back to my part of the world, and we should recognize that in the last three years, this has been a lot of change. I think we are we move from energy from energy security to the security of energy. So we move back again to issues in the area that are related with hard security. And that, if I look on the Black Sea, I should say, you know, this is one part of the world that the borders were moving, and of course this is going to have an effect on whatever we are going to think about completing Europe. I think first and foremost, I think we have to be able to do on the Black Sea. Uh, something that we are not currently doing so, which is frankly to be able, you know, to have a stable and peaceful environment, including the fact that uh, moving borders all the time is going to have an influence of the way you are going to explore resources. And if we look on the offshore resources, especially, we'll see that now you have uh, some difficulties in order to figure out what, what parts of the Black Sea where they belong to or what kind of rules you should apply, which of course should be the international law, but how you could, could be enforced in the question in the, in the 
uh, taking into account that you have an illegal occupation of Crimea, for example. Another thing I wanted to mention is that we need to, you know, of course, we need to connect the dots. And I think Romania is a significant player in a way because it's one of the countries, if not the country, that can still live out of its own indigenous resources. I think the big challenge for Romania has been that we have not seen a drop of oil or natural gas coming from other resources than our territory. I think it's important that we do the connections and we see it both ways. Diversification of supply, not only the diversification of the markets. So I think it's important that for us, uh, when we are embarking on, this kind of, on all these interconnection projects, to be able to, as well, to show what is going to come in Romania, not only what is going to come out of Romania, which is in a way the issue that was before, I think, mentioned by Professor Roberts, which was the idea that you need market integration, not only infrastructure, new infrastructure. Uh, we should uh, be sure that we highlight the Black Sea as much as it should be, because, of course, today we spoke a lot about the Mediterranean. Of course, the three seas is about the Baltics, and it's about the other seas, but we have to all the time, we have to recognize that uh, when it comes to the Black Sea, it's a lot less, so to say, public eye on the issues going on. And, you know, I see former minister Natalia German of Republic of Moldova, and we could see some of the countries around the Black Sea and how the security of the Black Sea including the energy security and the security of energy is linked as well with the stability of all these countries. So, you know, Romania, I think it's moving into the right direction in terms of finding more uh, natural gas, offshore resources. I think this is uh, the game changer has been that, as you said, we are, we are back in, um, uh, we are back in a perspective that we could be able to find uh, reserves that would be not only enough for Romania, but would be, would, would be a game changer at the level of the region, because this would mean that, uh, you know, uh, we could supply others, if, you know, if the resources are enough, because at the end it's about, of, uh, it's about the arithmetics of the reserves, and, you know, the arithmetics of the resources that could be brought from out of the area and from, the, from inside the area and put into the market. So uh, we are working with our partners. Of course, what makes things easier in a way, and some of these initiatives uh, should take stock more, is about is European policies. Because at the end, we have a common energy policy in Europe. And I think we have both the Vice President of the Commission, Vice President Shevkovic, and the Commissioner, Commissioner Canete, that actually they are keen on this interconnection, wall, uh, interconnection in all respects of the energy markets inside Europe. And uh, uh, in a way, if you look, uh, we could see that our area is doing less than the others, but if you, if you see how issues are when it comes to France and Spain about electrical energy, for example, you could see that is not something new. Actually, energy is one of the, play, one of the markets that still has, has a, lot, a long way to go in order to uh, to really offer full interconnectivity. You know, if you look in the way of energy, electric energy, for example, it's an issue which is related to the infrastructure. When it comes to oil and natural gas, of course, it's a matter of, uh, it's, a, it's another issue that is related to the uh, infrastructure and infrastructure financing at the end of the day, because, you know, you have specific facilities stemming from the Commission, which gives uh, you the right to access the right cohesion funds in order to bring more connectivity in the energy markets. So, this was my initial comments. It was more a national point of view and the need to, to, do, to focus more on the Black Sea and uh, uh, not only on the, other, on the other two seas. And uh, actually, we, are, we were the one of the, so to say, the ones before the, the Three Seas Initiative because, you know, Romania, when we established this type of security cooperation between Turkey, Romania and Poland, Exactly, this is, we could say that this was the, these were the forefathers of what we are discussing today. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, before I turn to Michal, uh, so I was at remiss at the beginning of this panel. Uh, I wanted to apologize. We have a very strict policy at the Atlantic Council of not putting on what we call manals. That's panels with men only. <laughs> and I think this is the only exception during the two days of the summit. And of course, it's not your fault, gentlemen. But uh, again, apologies on behalf of the Atlantic Council. And of course, we don't hold that against you, Michal. So let me turn to you. Uh, Michal Kobosko is the director of our Rotslav Global Forum. Uh, and in Rotslav, the presidents of the three seas countries, the 12 countries, will convene now for the third time after New York in 2015 and Dubrovnik in, in 2016 to discuss how to take the project forward. So, Michal, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. First, please accept my apologies for not being a woman in this panel. I'm not trying to play this role. Um, I'm uh, going to talk about the, the significance, importance of the, of the free seas concept from the Polish perspective. And um, we were listening, this morning we were listening to President Erdogan and uh, he was outlining this ambitious plan for Turkey, the Vision 2023, uh, commemorating the centenary of the Turkish independence. And in a way, uh, the free seas is for Poland, for Central Europe, uh, what this Vision 2023 is for Turkey. A very ambitious plan. And uh, to quote again our report from 2014, completing Europe. This is what the whole idea is about. Completing Europe, finishing the job which was not done yet. In this part of the world, in Central Europe, we have lots of east-west connections, which we understand very well where it comes from. This is history, this is uh, the division of the continent, and so on and so on. And what is missing are the functional uh, north-south uh, connections, uh, both in the, in the energy, um, the transport, the, the roads, the rail connections, and the telecommunication, the digital economy. So this, uh, this whole idea is about um, developing further these missing parts of the, of the specific companies. Uh, but, so the dominant supplier is there, and uh, these countries, these 12 countries of the Baltic, Black Sea and Adriatic region, they, they differ very much. They differ also on the level of the de dependence on the Russian oil and gas. For Poland, it's been a, a strong case uh, for long years, and we've been fully dependent on the supplies from uh, these uh, partners. Uh, not any longer. We are doing a lot to uh, reduce the dependence what uh, John mentioned, the LNG terminal in Poland, which was uh, completed last year, and it, right now we have already a decision about doubling its, uh, its capacity in coming years. And uh, just yesterday we had an information revealed about the first contract from Chenier to supply US LNG to Poland by the um, middle of uh, June. So in a few weeks, there's going to be the first ever supply of the US LNG to, po to Poland to its uh, LNG terminal. The other solution of the other project that Poland is uh, uh, deeply involved in and it's heavily promoting is the so-called the Baltic pipe. The Baltic pipe, the gas connection, which um, if constructed, will link uh, Polish LNG terminal to, the, to, the, to Denmark and then to the Norwegian shelf. So another, another supply, another way or channel of supplying gas to, to Poland and to Central Europe. Uh, we are expecting um, a decision from our Croatian friends, as John said, about the Kirk terminal. And this is like, I wouldn't say a never ending story, but a, a story that sooner or later <laughs> should have its happy ending, we hope so, because we, at the end of the day, we should have, to put it in a very simplistic way, two entry points, one in the north, the terminal in Poland, and one in the south, terminal in Croatia, at the Isle of Kirk. And this is also what we are explaining to our American friends, that uh, their exports, their oil and gas exports might be directed uh, to, this, uh, to these directions. So maybe, maybe I stop here and let you let you go further. Thank you, Dave.
Thank you, Michal. I'm, I'm glad you talked about happy endings. Uh, but we are really hoping that 2017, after more than 30 years of contemplating the Croatian LNG terminal option, 2017 will finally be the year when NFID will be taken on that floating regasification unit. Let me turn back to General Jones and, and uh, push him a little bit. You, you mentioned in your original presentation uh, the U.S. strategic interest. If you could just elaborate on why this should matter for the U.S. and in what concrete ways can the administration engage and then what could private investors uh, go? Sure. Um, I think uh, this, this uh, project is uh, a real 21st century security project. Uh, and I don't mean security in the classic Cold War sense, but it is a, it is a, a security project that, that reaches out uh, economically to the welfare of Europe. It addresses a, an energy problem that needs to be resolved and it addresses infrastructure problem in Central and Eastern Europe that have really never been taken on since the end of the Cold War. Uh, I might say as a longtime uh, resident in Europe and also an observer of, of, uh, of Europe that I think there's another thing that, that we need to tackle, and, and that is that the the way in which Central and Eastern Europeans look at the world and look at the threats that face them is much more aligned to the way Americans look at the world and the threats that face them than it is with our traditional Western European allies. And I'll give you an example uh, of that in the sense that there is a very famous security conference every year in Munich, Germany in February. It's the Munich Security Forum. Um, and it covers a whole range of topics. And we've tried now for the last two years to uh, have this topic introduced as a major panel type discussion. And um, the, the Western European disinterest in that is, is visible. Um, so we have some work to do um, in terms of how we see the threats in Europe and in the United States, uh, notably from Russia in particular with its use of energy. Um, there was a tendency, I think, in some Western Euro European capitals, whether it's Iran or Russia, to uh, think that by placating them and by, um, by investing and by trading that you can change behavior. Um, you know, I think history suggests that that's not going to happen. Um, and so I, I do think we have some collective work um, to do in, in, in Western Europe to, number one, get the enthusiasm there that exists in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, this is good for the European landmass. Uh, it's not directed, it's not u uniquely punitive, but it's to give, for, for Russia or anybody else, but it's, it's to give people economic opportunities and, and economic freedoms and lift the entire Central and Eastern European landmass up to the, up to, uh, and to do things that should have been done to, as the initial report said, to complete, to complete Europe. Thank you. Thank you, General. Ambassador, if I may come back to you and ask you two questions. One about the engagement uh, of Brussels and the European Union. So, I mean, a lot of this a lot of these projects are not new. Many of them have been on the table for quite some time. Some of them received EU support uh, in the transportation sector. Some of these projects are part of the so-called 10T corridors. So we did not want to reinvent the wheel with the report. What we wanted to, to do is to give a, an added impetus to the, to the political dynamics and, and the regional coordination with the help of, of Brussels as well. So how do you see the engagement of, of Brussels and the European Commission in, in particular? And of course, also the European Investment Bank and, and, and some of the Juncker Fund uh, involvement in, in funding FRISI's uh, initiative project. And the second question is, you, you've talked about Moldova uh, already and, and, and other Black Sea countries. Sort of our vision, what we call the phase two, uh, in addition to the original now EU member countries, uh, the 12 countries, that the so-called FRISI's countries, uh, we envisioned this to, and it was part of the original report to some extent as well, 
the, the Western Balkans, of course, and then beyond that, the Eastern Partnership countries and Turkey as well. So in an age when fully-fledged political engagement, enlargement, uh, inclusion of these countries into the European Union will not be possible for the foreseeable future, unfortunately, can this be a vehicle to engage those countries through infrastructure integration and through promoting economic and trade integration? Yeah, no, in, no, in, in respect, you know, the Europe is, Europe is there, and I think this is how you could see it, because there, the, the, even the little number of interconnections that we have done so far, and I should mention, for example, the one between Romania and the Republic of Moldova, if you know, it, you know it, it was possible because of the EU engagement, and there are the funds there. Of course, there is the Juncker plan that is just at the beginning, and we should not forget that there is a competition about resources in Europe, so, you know, for Europe, is the same, is as much important, if not less, as I mentioned, you know, interconnection between France and Spain when it comes to electricity or Portugal, you know, when, then it is in this part of the world. For us, I think, uh, you know, the initiative is to give uh, political dynamics, and I think this is all, what it's all about, is bringing political dynamics and political coherence. Uh, you know, there is a multiplication of initiatives, and we should recognize that sometimes, you know, we should not speak one of, with, or without the other, because we can, you cannot differentiate the discussion on security with the discussion on energy, especially in this part, you know, the, the engine-driven part of the energy security discussion has been security all the time. And this is the reason, if you look on the map, you could clearly see what, what is all about and why these countries and are so much afraid, you know, is the, either the military almighty or, you know, the, the economic prowess of, you know, of uh, natural gas giants like Gazprom, you know. So, you know, in, I think it's something that cannot be separated. In a way, you have other toolboxes for the peer security that you could address, of course, the first and the foremost being NATO. So it's important to give more interconnection impetus, uh, but on the other hand, we have to recognize that connection and interconnection, it's a matter of how you want to look into, you know. So if I, if I want to go on a highway from Big Rest, my first priority would be to go to the center of Europe. No, so if we look on the map, we have to see that some of these countries have their own priorities. Interconnection between them is a discussion, but it's, you know, interconnecting in, in a way should be, it's a discussion about interconnecting the periphery. But what we are mostly interested in is the periphery to become the center. And, you know, the interconnection between the periphery and the center are the main strategic drivers for all these countries. So first you achieve it, and then you do the other networks. Uh, but, uh, and uh, I think slowly, slowly, we, uh, the, what is the most important is to put together all the projects. I think each of our countries has done quite a lot in the last years. And uh, I heard here about storage, LPG, uh, LNG terminals, you know. So I think there is this kind of diversification, and it's already there, and we should put them together, and this is what is about the initiative in itself, and try to see what is the most efficient way to interconnect. And secondly, it's about uh, putting, uh, you know, trying to do it with Brussels together, because I think Brussels should be part of it, because at the end of the day, it's a European taxpayer money that is going to be the mostly appropriate source of financing. I don't think that, you know, any country who could access uh, grants should take loans, for example. And this is a matter of philosophical convergence of uh, economic convergence for all the countries of the area. You know, how they get better use of the European funds and, uh, and I think all of the countries are benefiting from the cohesion policy. So I think, you know, we, we, we, we need to keep track of the, of the process, but we have to recognize as well that the process is different than it was initially designed because we have an, hard security issues in the region. And I think hard security issues are very clear here to stay. And, you know, just yesterday we had this collision on the Black Sea between a military vessel of, the, of Russian military vessel and, you know, 
a cargo that was carrying Romanian ship to I don't know where. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I mean, on the Juncker fund issue, uh, above 90% of, of the funds so far went to the EU15, so the yeah. Western European countries, but that has partly to do with absorption capacity and bankable projects presented by Central and Eastern Europe, so it's, <coughs> it's, it's on us to present these projects for Yes, and, uh, and as well, you make the difference, you know, if, if the others don't have access to grants, which is cohesion funds. So, you know, the focus in my country and I think in Poland and the other countries, first of all, in, in, in cohesion funds, which are grants. And then we think about taking loans, because at the end of the day, yep. the Juncker plan is about loans. Yep. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, the cost of opportunity. You know, what you have at hand. Yeah. John, three questions. One, uh, in the original report in 2014, uh, you flagged the so-called backbone pipeline. There would be a larger capacity pipeline that would connect Svinojuszcze, the Polish LNG terminal up in the north, with the future Kruk, Croatian LNG terminal. Uh, and that's a fairly expensive undertaking that could not be funded on a purely commercial basis. Uh, and then there are smaller interconnections that are partly built already and partly are in the planning process, such as the Polish-Slovak interconnector. So do you still de see the need for that backbone interconnection or you see that the smaller interconnections will link up the market sufficiently enough that, uh, that it will work well? The second question about Nord Stream. So how does Nord Stream 2, the expansion of the existing uh, pipeline or the doubling of the capacity of, of the Nord Stream route would have, what impact would it have on, on the Three Seas Initiative as a whole and the, and the projects we are talking about in the, in the gas sphere? And then the third question is about Turkey. So how does Turkey fit into this whole picture, especially from a natural gas angle? The first thing concerning backbone, I put this out as a concept. What was required is a north-south link. I did try to evaluate one, particularly in the second report, one particular approach. But throughout, I was absolutely emphatic that what was required was some kind of a connection. And in whatever should be done in terms of utilizing existing pipelines, expanding existing systems, was to be preferred. What I was concerned with was the core element, which is paradoxically not from LNG terminal to LNG terminal, but from the junctions with the Yamal pipeline in the north and the Brotherhood system southern extensions. It's the gap between those two that needs to have an emergency capacity. This is the so-called N minus one capacity. What happens if for one reason or another you do without one major supplier? And that's the element that needs to be up, I would have said, at around 12 to 15 BCM a year, rather than the classic four to five BCM pipelines that we're seeing built as interconnectors. So I still hold to the concept of a backbone, but I'm completely flexible as to which elements get used. The most important thing is that the regulatory structure for such a pipeline be there, that in an emergency it can be used and it should be bi-directional. Uh, on Nord Stream 2, the impact was fearful if you were in the Baltic states. You thought psychologically this will cut you off. That fear to a certain extent has been eased not by the development of the um, LNG terminal at Klaipeda in Lithuania. And indeed, we know it's been eased because the Lithuanians have had no problem in just going back to Gazprom and getting a better deal than ever. Uh, so it works. I think the biggest thing about Nord Stream 2 is that the conditions now are very different from when we were first looking at the project 
two or three years ago, let alone when we were looking at the original Nord Stream. Gas coming from Nord Stream 2 is going to enter a much more competitive market. In effect, Gazprom is de facto pricing its gas at pretty close to local hub prices that are basically free market prices. That is already, in a sense, a tribute to the development of increasingly improved infrastructure within Europe. So in that sense, we're getting somewhere. I'd, I'd like to make the, the classic point that whereas only four years ago, Russian gas to some parts of Europe was being sold at twice the price that it was going to other parts of Europe, even though the distance was virtually the same. As of March or the beginning of April, the gas price in the three Baltic states and in Poland and in Germany was pretty much identical because of competition and improved connectivity. So Nord Stream's impact is essentially bringing not necessarily more gas, but gas by a different route into the heart of an increasingly competitive market. The damage it does is to the revenues of Ukraine, which loses transit revenue. In terms of supply to Europe, it's probably now pretty neutral, but it does damage Ukraine. Lastly, on the role of Turkey, I remain worried by Turkey's role in energy transit. Turkey, just as we have been talking about the energy terminal at Svinushka in northern Poland as being the Baltic terminal and Kirk Island as being the Adriatic terminal, so in effect, de facto is Turkey the Black Sea terminal because you can't have an LNG plant effectively in uh, uh, uh, the European section of the Black Sea. So what that means is you need to connect up the southern gas corridor pipelines, the TANAP pipeline and the TAP pipeline to the Balkans and that is going to happen. But that means your entry point in Turkey becomes incredibly important. Why am I concerned? Very simply, there is a concentration of gas coming through Turkey that I believe is potentially vulnerable, not to the classic fear that we've had from Russia, that the state might cut it off. But if this country becomes unstable, I go back to the problem that one witnessed in July and August 2015, when there were a series of five attacks, four on gas pipelines and one on a train carrying gas carrying pipe for the construction of the TANAP line. If there is instability in Turkey, if the war with the PKK expands, I think energy installations are likely to be a potential target. So my argument is to turn that on its head and say that what Turkey really does need to move as fast as possible towards a resumption of peace negotiations or ne however you want to phrase it, but negotiations to achieve a settlement of the Kurdish conflict, because that is, as Turkish military officers have described it, an active war. Thank you, John. So we have less than five minutes left. So let me try to bring in the audience. 
maybe it starts with Ambassador Payet, if I, if I may, uh, we unduly neglect Greece in this whole equation, uh, while at the same time it's such a critical part of the, of the North-South corridor and an entry point uh, to non-EU gas or gas from outside the EU from Turkey. Uh, and eventually from the East Bed and Caspian and, and, and, and other regions as, as well. And of course you could eventually bring that gas all the way to Ukraine and Central European markets as well. So if I may just call upon you to, to join the conversation. Um, I would make two observations. I mean, first of all, I think if you look at the past few years of U.S. engagement with Europe, one of the truly significant accomplishments is the progress that's been made across a broad swath of Central and Eastern Europe on energy independence. And the biggest challenge there is building resilience for Ukraine. From that standpoint, um, all of the measures that have been talked about here are, are welcome. But I would also emphasize, as I did in my remarks yesterday, uh, the focus of the Greek government on reinforcing a north-south corridor and the feasibility of beginning very quickly um, gas deliveries in that corridor from Rebethusa in Greece up through Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and into Ukraine. Uh, this is technically feasible right now. And I think the challenge is to get a conversation going, first of all, with our European partners. And in this regard, I, I would really commend the role uh, that Commissioner Sefcovic has played in helping to um, facilitate the framework for reverse flow, first through Slovakia um, into Ukraine. And then also, I think, getting the four governments connected. And as I noted in my remarks yesterday, that conversation already began in a very real way when Prime Minister Tsipras was with President Poroshenko um, in February in Kyiv. So this, I, I hope, will remain a priority for all the parties. And as um, I think a couple of the panelists pointed out, the other importance of developing this, this, this Greek hub is how it unlocks the whole Western Balkans and, and reduces the energy island that was described there. Thank you, Ambassador. There was a question in the middle. Thank you. Bogdan Kiritsoyu from Romania. I have a question for the, for the panel, especially for Mr. Koboska and Mr. Roberts. Uh, how do you perceive the draft agreement between the European Commission and Gazprom on changing trading conditions uh, towards Central Eastern European states? Are yes. they any helpful in the picture, in the context you presented? Do they add to anything? Any other questions before I turn to the panel? No? Great. Ambassador, you want to start? Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you so much, Ambassador. You know, I served as well in Athens, so in a way I should have started my speech a bit. You know, it's not so much related about the three seas, but I think this so-called vertical corridor, Ambassador mentioned, is, the most, is one of the most feasible in our opinion. In the same time, it was Romania supporting first. And I think this is an illustration of the, so to say, of the thesis that I mentioned, you know, for Romania, psychologically, it's so important to get a drop of natural gas coming to Romania from any other source than Gazprom or our own indigenous resources. And the vertical corridor itself, it looks like something that is very feasible, and it's about the reverse flow, uh, has a lot of value added in terms of security of energy, of energy security, sorry, because actually it's about not only Ukraine, but you know, from Romania, you can go to Republic of Moldova too, and this is what we'd like to see. So I think we are a strong supporter. We are supposed to have a meeting of the foreign ministers on the subject. It was postponed for, for some time now because actually there was a change of the agenda, but I think this is going to be one of the main dishes we are going to have at any kind of conversation so to say, with our Greek, Bulgarian uh, friends, and uh, we are strongly supporting it. About sure. the other thing, I think it's mostly, I would, uh, would be more interested to see the other's opinion about the Gazprom and the EU. Great. John, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, first of all, Gazprom and the EU. Uh, I think we are moving to an overall settlement of the outstanding issues between Gazprom and the EU, including ending uh, the case 
concerning Gazprom's abuse of its monopoly. And I think that although there are some details still to be settled, in effect, this is on the basis of Gazprom accepting unequivocally that all its operations within the EU will be conducted under EU rules and that there will be no grandfathering in of what they would hope would be pre uh, rules dating back to before the third energy package came in. Uh, there's one point I would say quickly. Reverse flows to Ukraine do need to be stressed. Also, try to bear in mind the difference between projects that are underway, such as the Brewer system, which is being expanded through Romania, and similar approaches like the vertical corridor, which in effect is being put into practical action by projects like Brewer, and which we hope will come into a real achievement with a proper interconnector between Greece and Bulgaria. Um, but one sounds big, the vertical corridor. Brewer is fairly, in that sense, limited. But you've got to understand these big projects are no longer conceived of as 20, 30, 40 BCM systems that are going to cost the equivalent amount in billions of dollars. Uh, they are much smaller practical systems. The only question is, is there a core element that does need to be sized up to cope with the N minus one issue? What happens if the biggest supplier for some reason drops off the radar? Thank you, John. Uh, Michal? Um, General Jones, can you bring us home? Well, I think we have a, had a very clear discussion on, on where we are. Um, I, um, we have some work to do in Washington with the new administration. Uh, we have made good progress in the public and the private sector in Washington um, on, on being a part of this, uh, recognizing that the dominant effort has to come from the European landmass, but it, it is a very interesting and 21st century way of connecting the transatlantic uh, partnership that existed for so long and so well in the 20th century and now has to move into other things, excuse me, other things beyond classic military throw weight and, and armies and navies and air forces, although that's still part of the equation. But I, I think that the, the, this is a, the reason that I really like this project is because uh, it, it, it transcends other things. It's not, it's not one dimensional. It, it really will uh, want to, when it gets going. And this is why I think that we need to figure out now, this year, hopefully, where it's going to, how we're going to do this and how we're going to operationalize it. At the same time, we need to cultivate uh, the new American administration's interest. Um, it won't surprise you when I tell you that the, the new Secretary of State, uh, with whom I've, I've met many times uh, on this, in this previous incarnation as, as the chairman and CEO of Exxon, um, is very interested in this project. And he, he understands it. He understands the strategic aspects of it. He understands the economic aspects. So I, I think we, we and, and we have a, a new president who's very transactional in the business sense. And so I don't think that's going to be a really heavy lift. I think we will get uh, that kind of interest. And, and uh, so I think the next two meetings uh, on the 4th of June in Warsaw and, and a little bit later on, uh, the heads of state um, in Poland, um, this this will be a big year for the project, and and uh, I must I must say that all along since 2014, the encouraging role of the European Union has been uh, very encouraging as well. Thank Some you, General. Key members. Thank you, General Michal. Ten seconds. Ten seconds or eight seconds. Let Let me just add to what General said. Uh, 
uh, just inviting all of you to come to Poland for the Wroclaw Global Forum early July, 6 and 7 July, to be combined with the Free Seas Presidential Summit. General mentioned that President Trump is, is invited to attend the Free Seas Summit, and we hope that he will add uh, visit in Poland to his trip to Europe, uh, because the President will attend the G20 meeting in Hamburg in Germany on July 7th, we have invited the President to come to Poland a day before and to meet the leaders of the region of Central Europe, of these 12 EU countries, to discuss in what way America can be present and more engaged in Central Europe, both in the oil and gas and in investments, uh, investment area. So please come to Poland early July, Wroclaw Global Forum and the Free Seas Summit. Thank you, David. Thank you, Michal. Uh, we ran a little over, for which Vicente is going to yell at me. Uh, we have five minutes until the next session starts, which is going to be in uh, this room, right? Uh, it's going to be on the refugee crisis. Thanks again for this wonderful panel conversation. Thanks for the devoted audience for uh, sticking through the panel after lunch. It's always a <laughs> difficult slot. Uh, and yeah, let's give a round of applause for the panelists.